Hi, everyone. Welcome to Throughline. Thank you so much for joining in. My name is Neha Malhotra. I'm your host. Um, I had the recruiting department here at Bay One. Thank you so much again for joining us. Um, we're going to give folks some time to come on and uh, we'll get started. Today we have a great panel discussion on how to retain diverse talent and some actionable things you and me can do to create a more inclusive environment at work. We have a formidable lineup of panelists. Let me start the introduction, uh, but before, just wanna go over a um, few housekeeping um, items. If you have a question, kindly uh, post the question in the chat and I can weave that in in our discussion. Uh, so kindly, yeah, uh, post your questions in the chat and we'll get them covered. Um, I wanna welcome Denise Lombard. In her role as the Director of Supplier Diversity, Risk and Ethics, Global Procurement Services at Cisco, Denise was responsible for Cisco's Supplier Diversity Program, where she provided development opportunities for women, minority, veterans, and disabled veteran-owned businesses. In her 16 years with Cisco, she led teams through transformations across several business functions, all adding to her breadth of knowledge in the industry. In addition, she is highly passionate about giving back to the community. Her advocacy includes being a court appointed special advocate for Maricopa County's CASA organization to provide critical advocacy for children in foster care that have been abused, neglected, or abandoned. She co-led the San Jose Connected Women's Community Outreach Pillar, which is focused on helping young women towards STEM careers. And she worked closely with Girl Scouts and Citizen Schools. Denise is also a member of Baywind's Board of Advisors. Denise is a dynamic and innovative leader with extensive global experience to further guide our company in our mission to advance gender diversity in the workforce. Welcome, Denise, to the panel. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks, Neha. Next up is Madhavi Basin, uh, VP of Diversity and Inclusion at Okta. Uh, Madhavi is a change leader with over 10 years of experience in successfully managing global programs focused on social impact, capacity building, and sustainable change. She is passionate about designing approaches for collective impact through social change projects. Currently, she is leading Okta's diversity and inclusion efforts. Welcome, Madhavi, to the panel. Thank you so Thank much you for joining so us. Great to be here. Next up is Cecil. Cecil Plummer is the president of the Western Regional Minority Supplier Development Council, one of the top performing NMSDC councils. Cecil Plummer formerly worked with Robert Half for 17 years and left his position as the director of CSS Strategic Solutions to join the council. He has over 15 years of executive leadership experience and possesses a solid background in strategic sourcing change management, performance and process improvement, supplier diversity, strategic planning, and risk management. Welcome Cecil to the panel. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me today. Thank you. So we'll start off. Um, my first question would be to Madhavi. Um, Madhavi, when you think of the future of work, where does the concept of belonging fit? And in your opinion, how important is it and where does one start? Because honestly, we've had instances where we felt we don't belong and it really sucks. Yeah, um, that's a great question to kick off. A um, couple of thoughts there. The first most important thing is it's when we say future of work, we think it's, it's something future in time. It is not. We are actually living the future of work. It's, it's a lot of what we are encountering. And a lot of the thought is coming from the aspects of like, do you have hybrid work? Do you have dynamic work? Do you have all remote? I think a lot of those words are also complicating that space. When we all were in the office, belonging had a completely, or in, in work, physical workplaces, belonging had a completely different meaning. Now it has become both challenging and also easier. So it's not a one simple solution. So I'll give you two a quick examples to explain that. It's become challenging because obviously our employee base is more dispersed. You as leaders have to do a lot of things to make teams feel connected, 
invest in employee experience and culture. But there is also data and research to show that a lot of women and people of color feel that they don't have to encounter a lot of microaggressions that they used to when they actually went into the workplace. So the fact that you're in your own space and it's not like, you know, I'm the only one in the room. So when we're talking about that concept of creating more belonging, it's very important for leaders to understand that you have to strike that balance of connecting folks, but also making sure that when you're making these connections, who are the people on your team whose voices are you centering? Is it the marginalized group? Are you creating an equitable field more in the remote place? And to me, how can we do that? I, to be honest, I, I don't think there's a one size fits all to this because we are talking about diversity and we're talking about the concept of belonging. And it would vary from different companies' cultures. I would say, listen to your employee pulse surveys, listen to what people want and respond based on what your employees need rather than like, you know, figuring out like this is a blueprint that has worked at another company. But keep in mind, you're not only creating connections, you are also now have the opportunity to re-engineer the space so that you're centering the voices that we usually did not hear when we were in a physical workspace. That's a great point. And Malvi, about younger people, you know, coming into the workforce, they want to bring their authentic selves with tattoos, piercings, certain way they dress to express themselves. I think they're also kind of seeking a sense of purpose. We're in a purpose economy. Um, what is your viewpoint on that? You know, millennials seeking purpose. Um, you know, that's also shifted. What is your your take on that? I think, oh, and there is enough research. This is not just my thought. I think we try to box and say this is what the younger generation wants. I think every generation has had a social movement where they have put their weight behind. Like in the U.S., even if you talk from the civil rights movement, like every time the generation that comes into the social and I would say professional workspace brings some energy behind some cause. I think for the current generation, there is a lot around the force, which I am glad about, is the forces of equity. So I don't think what, what this generation, like, I, I do, I'm not very comfortable with like, this is what this particular generation wants. I think every generation wants what's top of mind social issues. But to your point, I think bringing their authentic selves to work, that's also a little bit of a charge term because we might tell people like, bring your authentic selves to work. But when they, and, and I lead PIB for a company, so I'm saying that, like, I'm like, I'm creating a culture where everybody can bring their authentic selves to work. They might work in a team and with a manager where they are like, I don't completely understand. This is not landing for me. So for me, the more important part is for leaders and organizations, before you ask the population to bring their authentic selves to work, first check yourself and see, are you able to absorb that? Are you able to respect that? Do your managers have that training of leading inclusive teams? So I think it's a little bit of like, we. I sometimes feel we throw them under the bus, be like, you know, wear your tattoos and all. And they sometimes show up at a sales customer meeting and you're like, you're not supposed to do this. So you have to provide them that guidance rather than just make a broad, broad stroke and put the onus on them. I think the onus should be on the organization and the leaderships in defining authenticity. Yeah, I see you shaking your head, Cecil. Your thoughts on it? Well, I think Mahavi, uh, and hopefully I pronounced your name pro properly, hit it right on the head. Um, belonging in the future of work is going to be absolutely critical. It's going to be absolutely critical to an organization's ability to continue to perform well and grow as the market continues to diversify from a employee perspective, but also from a customer perspective. It's going to be one of the most important aspects of businesses that want to perpetuate their growth. We have had a lot of organizations become very successful without being inclusive, but I think they're going to find that more difficult as time goes on. So as a leader, where does one start? You know, there's an old saying that says, no matter where you go, there you are. And, and so I'll tweak that a little bit. And, and just to explain that, you can't turn on and off who you are like a light switch. I'm one person at home and I'm another person when I'm in the office. You can pretend and you can follow rules in the office, but it really, as a leader, you have to start with authenticity. Are you honestly curious about others? Do you 
honestly make an effort in your life to include people um, in, who don't look like you, think like you, have different backgrounds of you. Because you can go through the motions, but an employee can feel when they belong. They can feel what the culture is like. They can feel whether they truly belong. And so it's not just about what goes on in the office. It's about what goes on before you ever get to the office. I encourage people all the time, are you curious? Do you watch movies, books, and, uh, and articles, um, listen to podcasts about um, if you're male, you know, if you identify as male, ab about women's issues? If you're Indian, do you research the backgrounds of African-Americans or Latinos? If you're Latino, do you, do you reach out and learn things about the LGBT community or whatever? Um, look at your life at home. When you go home, who are the group of people that are in your lives? Do they all look like you? And, and, and frankly, when you talk to most leaders, that's the problem. It's like you're trying to be one person in your professional life with a motivation of growing your business. And, and you're, that's not really who you are. So it really starts with internalizing. Where do you start? Really identifying what are your values as a human being, right? And not try to separate the human being from the manager. Once you decide what those values are, then you need to take steps to learn about it the same way you would do in your home. If you had, if you have two children and one children is special needs and one children's not, or child is not, what do you do? You learn about autism. You learn about hearing impaired and what those, what that child needs, and you immerse yourself in it and you begin to bring community around that, and that flows over into your professional life. And so if I'm going to encourage leaders is to really think about what is your value system? Do you think belonging is important at work? Because if it's important at work, it's important at home. And those are the things that um, I think those are the barriers to obtaining belonging in the workplace. Because at the end of the day, people know like what happens after work, who gets to go out for drinks, who gets to play golf, who goes running together. Um, you know, they, those things come out and more importantly, they filter down into your leadership team. And your leadership team knows if we're just trying to check a box so we can hire people and, and generate revenue, or are we trying to create a culture here? And I think that's the first place leaders need to start is by looking in the mirror, because belonging is going to impact your ability to recruit in the future. Because Gen Z, they don't play that. They wanna work for ethical companies, they want to work for companies where they're comfortable and they can be appreciated and it'll become a more and more of a critical aspect of growing any business into the future. Yeah. Great point, Cecil. And also an organization that doesn't have belonging or an inclusive environment is going to have a competitive disadvantage. And I really like your point. You can't switch, you know, who you are, you know, off at work. It's how you do anything is how you do everything. Um, so thank you for that perspective. Uh, Denise, the next question is for you. Um, in the last three, four years with the great resignation through COVID, um, we are also seeing a quiet quitting phenomena. For folks that feel that they don't belong, are they more prone to leave uh, now versus pre-pandemic? Yeah, I, I picked this question because I thought it was really easy. The answer is absolutely yes, they are more <laughs> prone to leave. And I think most of us know that. I think um, all of us have probably experienced um, during the pandemic really questioning um, almost who we are, both professionally and personally, um, evaluating how we've been treated. You know, I think a lot of us have seen the statistics about the divorce rate went sky high. Well, so did the quitting rate. The, the great resignation went sky high because people started to really pause and think about what their priority are, priorities are and, and how they want to be treated. And um, so definitely we are still at risk. You know, there's so many uh, young mothers out there, too, that are struggling with, is this really worth being away from my children, missing this time with my children? So you see a lot of women uh, young women exiting the workforce. And I think we as leaders really need to be in touch with this. And that means uh, over communicating. I know that's such an old used term, but, you know, instead of checking in and seeing if they finished all their action items or where they are on their project, I hope 
leaders are having a genuine conversation about how are you feeling? How's the family? Uh, am I rewarding you in the right way you want to be rewarded? You know, maybe you're giving uh, Jenna a stock every time you can. Well, maybe Jenna doesn't care about stock. Maybe Jenna needs more money in her paycheck um, to pay for, for rent or whatever. So really genuinely getting to know your employees, how they want to be valued, how they're feeling. Um, is there some things you could do as a leader to change um, and having those honest discussions. And it doesn't mean every time you have that discussion with an employee, you're going to be able to meet 100% of their needs. But you're going to allow this employee to make an educated decision on, is this the right place for me or not? Is my leader willing to change and negotiate some of the things that I need or not? And I think that could benefit both the employer and the employee. Thanks, uh, thanks, Denise. And it's about attachment, right? When you feel belonging, you feel an attachment to your company, to your organization, and that makes you feel motivated. And then you want to do your best work. So it's more of a heart connection. It's about winning the heart, not just the intellect. Um, Madhavi, you know, your take on this? Because it's just as easy as winning hearts. <laughs> It definitely is, but it uh, the other piece of, of the belonging, which I focus a lot on also is, it, it's it's the soft side of it, as you said, the heart, like, you know, is this a place where I see myself grow? But the other very important piece of your professional growth, your strategic growth, and your, your career is also, is your voice heard? Like, when you are sitting in meetings, are you the one who's like, okay, like, you know, we, we all know those examples of like, okay, you make a point and someone else then amplify it and then someone took the idea. I think a lot of that sense of belonging also comes from a lot of, like, those are signs for me to experience belonging or to experience the lack of belonging. So I think those, going back to what Cecil said, like, it, it's on the leader. It's on me as a leader of what kind of a space I want to create on my team. But creating those spaces where I feel that it's not just like, you know, check the box check-ins, like at the start of your one-on-ones, ask them, how are you doing? Like that, like some leaders do that. I've seen a lot like artificially and then let's move to the agenda. But when you have a team meeting, you forget every other context that your team member has shared at that and be like, oh, why are we behind on this? Forgetting like, you know, what was the context? So those are, I think those are the subtle clues that go very far in employees experiencing belonging or the lack of, rather than making it very, I've, I've seen a lot of leaders with, especially during COVID, make it more like check the box. I need to ask them, how are you doing? Is your kid okay? Or how they play? And then just like the rest of it is business as usual. It, that's not going to work out. Just as you find it's like you, your whole authenticity as a leader has to show up. So those are some of the important pieces that remember as a leader, Every action that you do or, or what you don't do, mm -hmm. that also sends a message of belonging to your employees. So those are very critical pieces to keep in mind as a leader. Yeah, and, and there is a talent war as well right now, you know, um, recruiting for the best talent and retaining them long term. I think it's also inextricably tied to the feeling of belonging or the sense of belonging and how you fit in. Um, next question, we're gonna cover leadership. We're gonna move our focus to, you know, how does one serve as an inclusive leader in this new global work workforce, sorry, with changing uh, workplace uh, demographics? Um, Cecil, what's, you know, what's your take on it? How do leaders facilitate a sense of belonging? Well, I think Maravi said something very important uh, a second ago. It's not just about what you do, it's about what you don't do. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that leaders don't fall into this trap of, you know, I want to be colorblind at work. I want to be gender blind at work, right? I mean, your employees are their mothers, their fathers, their sisters, their brothers, they, they're, they're people of color, they're people with different sexual orientations. And these things color who they are in every aspect of their lives. It colors what products they buy, it colors who they want to work for and who they don't want to work for. And so those omissions and under the guise of, hey, let's just keep it, you know, professional is, you know, can create really hostile work environments where people know like who I am is not really 
welcome here. Um, even when we talk about the workplace demographics, um, especially here in the Silicon Valley, where ageism is still very acceptable, right? It's acceptable to say, hey, I just want a young, hip, tech-savvy workforce, and people with experience aren't welcome. But we have to make sure as leaders that we are having these conversations, not creating safe spaces, but bringing it up, saying what people are thinking and getting those things in a strategic way um, out into the air. So the company and the leadership can say, this is what we value. We value people with these different perspectives. We value uh, young people with innovative thoughts. We, we value older employees with uh, experiences that are still relevant. Um, we also have to think about, especially in hybrid, how do we facilitate that that belonging, because everybody experiences that differently. And that's a key aspect of both um, retaining and acquiring talent is how do you keep them connected in a hybrid environment? When are you going to bring them to the office? When are we going to do office retreats? Keep in mind, some of these people are completely isolated. If they're single and they don't have children or an elder that they're caring for at home, they could be living in complete isolation. Um, and so it's important that we don't get stuck on, you know, like, the, the, hey, the money we can save by not having a facility, right? <laughs> it's really more about how can we include all of the diverse needs of our workforce, both um, remote and, and in person. And we've already talked about whether it's ethnic or, or gender. And yes, these ethnically diverse workforce is becoming uh, it's going to be, it's just getting browner and browner as, as time goes on, right? And so that's going to be key. Anybody who's in leadership is going to need to kind of become a multicultural expert. And the, and the good news is this isn't new, right? There was a time when work was kind of the boys club back in the 70s. And then they had to understand and how to create an inviting, safe, inclusive workforce uh, when, when women in the 70s and 80s really started entering the workforce in big numbers. And now you've got another shift. If you don't understand um, the cultural nuances of, of different people from different backgrounds and different ethnicities, it's going to be really difficult for you to hire and create a space of belonging. And it's going to be even more difficult for you to impact your customers. Think about the people you're going to be selling to. You're going to be more and more selling to managers and executives who are female, managers and executives who um, don't have U.S. origins. Uh, they have, that are, aren't from the U.S. and have different cultural values and norms, even in business communications. So the way that a leadership a leader can facilitate this sense of belonging really starts with educating yourself. And I'm going to be a broken record on this. If I can say broken record, a lot of people say, what's a record? That was back in the 70s. We don't use record. The vinyl is coming back. And vinyl is very cool. So I guess they broke a record. Um, but educating yourself, do you even know what cultural norms are for different people groups? Do you even care that you, you have to get that into yourself? Once you decide, yes, I care about this, uh, these things, I'm going to make sure myself and my leadership team are all educated on those things so that either intentionally or unintentionally, we're not being exclusive unintentionally and we are being intentionally inclusive, but it starts with educating and then making sure that publicly um, with the staff that these values are known, whether those values are flexibility and working remote or the importance of getting together and doing team building or whatever background a person has is from. Those are the most important things leaders can do to facilitate belonging is get it all out in the open and make sure you show value. I'm going to go back to what Mada, Maravi said a, a few minutes ago. It's not only about what you do, it's what you don't do. If you're ignoring the heritage weeks, if you're ignoring the important things um, of events of people's lives, you know, pregnancies, divorces, whatever it is, uh, marriages, then you're going to have trouble creating an inclusive environment. Yeah, great point there, Cecil. And as you said, we're getting browner and browner. There was one statistic that um, states that more than 50% of the U.S. population by 2045, um, you know, there will be no single racial majority demographic in the country. Um, so yeah, definitely changing demographics there. Um, have a great question from the audience. What positive examples of inclusivity have you seen from leadership? 
Oh, is that for me or for anyone? Uh, anyone can see that. I need to jump in. You know, certainly um, at Cisco, I think it starts with how the leader on boards an employee. So making sure they're connected with somebody that they're not just treading water by themselves. There's somebody there connected, not only um, the leader connecting with that employee, but they have a buddy we used to call it that connects with them and helps them navigate and make introductions to keep stakeholders um, that'll be critical to their success. Um, another area too is if your company has employee resource groups and making sure your employee knows all the different employee resource groups. And uh, just because they uh, look brown or, or look a certain way doesn't mean point them to there, share the, all of the employee resource groups. Maybe there's a LGBTQ, maybe there's an LGBTQ ally, um, maybe there's, you know, mother's uh, group. So pointing them to other groups that may have similar uh, backgrounds and beliefs that they have um, will help them feel um, in a smaller group belonging, which will hopefully spread to a larger feeling of belonging. Yeah, I, I also want to jump in with one quick example. It's, it's going back to what I say, I'm a huge fan of signs and what signs portray. So I have a, one of my leaders, when he interviews anybody, or when he's speaking at a panel discussion or he's at an all hands, like wherever there are like multiple people, he always jumps in. So he's a cis, cisgender white man, but he will say, my name is so-and-so and my pronouns are he and him. Now, it is amazing because usually in our heads, you, you share your pronouns if you have a different gender identity or sexual orientation. That's how we are trained. Like if you're sharing your pronouns, then you're trying to send a different message. But that leader simply by saying like, it, it's not because you are different and special, you need to do this. This is how culture works. And that I'm always like blown away. And I'm like, and I'll be honest, like I lead diversity and inclusion. And sometimes when I introduce myself, I forget. And I was like, oh, David, how do you remember it? He's like, that's just how my brain operates. And that's what an inclusive leader is. So the point is like the small things that leaders do, they send a huge message of the kind of the culture they bring to the team. So uh, the, 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 the small acts and the optics of it really, really take your leadership style and yeah. speak more than your words would. Yeah, I'd like to also um, just cite an example, and it just happened, so I have to talk about it. Uh, happy Diwali, everybody. It happened on Diwali on Friday, last Friday, and it happened at the Bay One headquarters, and I, it just gave me goosebumps, so I have to go over it. Um, so, you know, Diwali is a big deal. We dance, we eat, you know, it's a big festival, festival for Indians. And so we hired a catering company and there were two girls that came over with the catering company and they were really sweet, helping everybody, putting out food, making sure everyone has what they need. And the music starts to go and people start to dance and we have a little makeshift dance floor where we used to do our meetups. And so I saw two of the leaders in our company go and grab those girls' hands and bring them into the makeshift dance floor. And I could just see their armor drop and they became part of us. They became part of the group and everybody had such a great time um, after that. And they were extra sweet and, you know, I'll always remember them. So, and it dawned on me, this is why I work here. You know, this is exactly why, you know, I love it here. So just wanted to cite that. Yeah, and yeah, that's a great example of what I call, if you're not intentionally including, then you're unconsciously excluding. Yeah. So that's an example of you have to be very intentional with inclusion because if you're not making an effort, that is leading to some form of exclusion. So it, it's not automatic. Absolutely. Great. Uh, Cecil, anything from you? Would you like to take a jab at this? Sure, sure. Uh, I, I just have to say authenticity and um, just being genuine is important. And the success story that I'm thinking about is when you see people in leadership that are diverse, that speaks volumes. You know, you can put posters on the walls and you can have employee resource groups and you can have, you know, days celebrating this, that, or the other. But at the end of the day, people need to uh, feel like they have a chance to realize their full potential at your organization. 
And so having an inclusive leadership teams is so important. And so I'm thinking of, you know, um, we're starting to see corporations, large corporations that have C-suite officers that are not just, you know, openly LGBT, but um, even trans, you know, um, or, or African-American or, or people who have, you know, physical disabilities showing up in leadership in the C-suite of your organization. And so, again, um, I have to say to leaders out there, if you want your organization to be as strong as it, as it can be, you need the insights, uh, all of these diverse insights to help you make better decisions and to lead your organization. And if your organization has a leadership team that is, you know, be, you know, homogeneous in some way, then you're you're missing out and you're inadvertently sending a message that this is really kind of all window dressing and it's really not about inclusion here. And uh, again, Gen Z, they're, they're sharp, right? And, and your competition is, is sharp. And I think those companies that are offering them a place where they can go be their authentic selves and, and succeed and see that they have the ability to succeed, um, are they're going to go there and they're going to work there. And at the end of the day, your competitors could be drawing from a bigger pool of talent than you. And it's, and it's tricky, right? Because you may have some customers that are um, not as progressive as you are. And in the short term, it might impact some things on your ability to interact with some of those customers. But I think in the long term, and so in the long term, um, you have to kind of put a stake in the ground and say, this is who our company is, and this is what we represent. We've seen big brands like Starbucks and Nike kind of drive a stake in the ground. They were kind of trailblazers with this stuff of who we are. And if you don't buy our stuff, oh well, but we've seen the world come around and continue to support those brands in a big way. And I think the same will be true of your organization. So you have to be wary of, um, you know, you have to be true to your values and there may be some implications to that short term, but I think long term you'll win. Great point, Cecil. Um, this question is for everyone. And it's my favorite question. Um, what are some of the everyday actions we can take, you and me, leaders, no matter what the role is, um, in cultivating an inclusive environment? Denise, you want to start? Yeah, I, you know, and, and as we've been talking and focus on leaders, too, I just want to make a side comment, too. So we as leaders also have peers and coworkers, and we need to also make sure our peers and coworkers are feeling welcome too. So not only just our employees, but you know, turnover of our peers hurts the business as well and hurts us as you know, peers as well. So I just, just wanted to make that comment that you know, ultimately I think the leader is accountable uh, for retaining their employees and engaging their employees. But I also think as leaders that are also coworkers and peers, we need to make sure our peers are feeling the same belonging, um, as well as the, the employee to the leadership. Um, one of the things that I think is really critical is mentorship and sponsorship. And I know you guys have heard this over and over again, but I can't say it enough. I think one of the biggest barriers for diverse talent, not getting promoted, not getting the career development is the lack of connection, uh, to invisibility, to leadership, to upper leadership. And I think what we've seen certainly at Cisco and other companies is it is mutually beneficial when you connect maybe, um, you know, an African-American woman with a baby boomer, older gentleman, uh, they learn from each other or a millennial with a boomer, you know, so these different uh, combinations of mentorship sponsorship is mutually beneficial to both parties. But, you know, the focus there is really providing that visibility networking opportunity and growth to these um, diverse employees that we want to help retain. But I mentorship and sponsorship, I'll say it again and again, how, how critical it is. Thank you, Denise. Madhavi, your perspective. Yeah, I would, I would share two things. One is for uh, the leadership. So for the leadership and these two are connected. So for the leadership, remember that you have a lot of authority because you are responsible. But the, the, the fact that you are a leader, you have a lot of power and a lot of authority. 
Now, how do you use that to forward the agenda of inclusion is up to you. I have seen a lot of leaders be like, oh, we have a head of diversity and it's this person's job. It certainly is not. It's every leader's job, basically, because you have the authority to make a lot of decisions. You're the one who's making hiring decisions, promo decisions, succession planning. You are doing all these things. So when you use your authority at every step, my advice and guidance would be bring in that lens of equity and inclusion. Like, are you thinking about it? Check for your own biases. How are you processing a lot of this information? So that definitely is the one big guidance. The other thing that I would say is, I hear this a lot, this kind of feedback from a lot of folks I talk to. They say, what can I do about DIB? I'm not in a leadership role. And I'm like, we all have influence. And I tell this to my interns as well. You all have a lot of influence that you bring to the table. How you treat your peers, as Denise said, and how do you show up each day? And most importantly, the kind of the questions that you ask. You can be an individual contributor. But trust me, this whole movement of even having DNI practitioners basically started with the employee base asking, like, where, where is the black population? We serve Hispanic customers. So remember, you have a lot of power. You have your questions have a lot of power to move companies to make big changes. So even if you're not in a leadership role, don't um, feel that you don't have the ability to make an impact because trust me, you have a lot of influence and there is a lot of power in numbers. Mm -hmm. And when we as corporations hear that our employees want something, you can only ignore it to a point. And after that, you're like, let's act on it. So if you're a leader, use your authority more inclusively. And if you're an individual contributor, lean into asking questions and using your influence to bring change. Okay. Great point. Cecil, your perspective? Sure. Um, every day, little, little things matter. Little things add up to be big things. So first I'll say, reach out. Reach out. Have coffee and lunch with someone um, who's not like you frequently. Um, someone from another uh, demographic group, whether they're, again, veterans or women or the LGBT community, younger, older, more experienced, less experienced, reach out and make contact. Um, the other thing is, and I'm going to beat this one to death, be curious. Be curious. Are you reading and watching and listening to things that are that you don't know about? Are you Are you interested? Are you curious? Is it important to you? You've got to do that. Uh, number three, I would say amplify voices. Um, one of the most important things you can do is making sure that you're uplifting and amplifying others, particularly if you're in a position of power. It means a whole lot when you hear someone who's an ally talking about or elevating issues about uh, another group. Um, you know, John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy were perfect examples of this. These are people who could have ignored everything that was going around them, the, the, right? They were, they were wealthy, influential people from the majority group. They didn't have to do any of this, but they were, they were leaders in that way. And the last thing I'll say, just to kind of jump on to what some of the other panelists talked about, is leadership is not always a position. Regardless of where you sit in your company, you can demonstrate leadership qualities by doing all of the things we've talked about, demonstrating who, who's part of your personal life, who's part of your professional life, um, elevating other voices, what you're listening to and reading um, from uh, to help increase your cultural awareness. That'll make impact. Speaking up and speaking out um, will make a tremendous impact um, up the chain, down the chain, and sideways. So oh, um, read about this really cool concept that I didn't know about. It's the golden rule versus the platinum rule. And the golden rule is you treat people how you want to be treated, but the platinum rule is you treat people how they want to be treated. And it was a game changer in my mind because we all are different and maybe the other person doesn't want to be treated like I want to be treated. Um, and that can only happen with the connection. I think building a connection, which does not happen overnight, you have to make an effort, as Cecil mentioned, um, you know, coffee, lunches, be a good listener. Um, I think, yeah, those are all key things. Thank you, Cecil, for that. Um, I'm going to jump into my next question. Um, but we're going to run a video before that. So, Rachel, let's run the video. Um, 
So a few weeks ago, I run into this older guy in tech. He asked me what I do for a living. I tell him, you know, I'm a neuroscientist. I do research at Stanford. I've been doing it for about a year now. Um, I earned my PhD nearly a year ago. Uh, pretty short conversation, maybe five minutes, and then he goes about his day, right? So I run into him a few weeks later and he tells me that he Google searched me because he didn't believe that I actually had a PhD. In his mind, it was more logical that I would be lying rather than believe I was actually capable of earning the degree I said I earned. I know this sounds like a small interaction, but it reflects a lot of issues in our society. These biases exist at every level in STEM and they hinder women and minorities' ability to have equal opportunity for success. There has been a lot of progress recently, but there is still work to be Such a powerful video, um, which brings me to the question, biases the leader's Achilles heel. How important is it to understand your own implicit biases when leading a team or just as a team member? Does knowing your biases make you more accountable? Because we're assuming we're free of unconscious bias, but are we? Yeah, I, I think we'd all like to believe um, that we're not susceptible to these biases, but um, we all engage uh, with these biases, whether we like it or not, because that's how our brain functions. Our brain likes to put things in categories and uh, make it easier for us to uh, do things. And uh, it trips us up. And I think being aware of that and not in denial of it um, is, is the first step. Um, and, you know, just making sure it goes back to, I think one of the first questions Madhavi was talking about, unique individuals. We need to look at people as unique individuals, even if they're, you know, I think there are some trends that happen with different generations and so forth, but you still have to dig into what is the unique individual want and need. And um, but put yourself in their point of view too, which I think a lot of us um, struggle with sometimes is like, well, I never did that. You know, I was always doing that, but put yourself in their shoes and, and you know, what they've been through experiences were, I think, can help a lot on um, trying to be aware, at least, of your biases, take a pause, think about um, some of your decisions and snap judgments um, before you make a decision. Cecil? Wow, this is a big topic. Uh, I'm going to say that, um, well, of course, um, it's very important to understand your biases. Uh, everyone has them, as Denise just said. I think it's also, though, important that we make sure we include words like unconscious in front of the bias and, mm -hmm. and use words like awareness when we can, because unfortunately, bias has taken on this very negative connotation, right? Um, and we know that those um, unconscious biases, I mean, it's, it's not even a decision. It's so quick. Uh, there have been studies that show like before you're even aware of it, your brain is already making decisions on your behalf based on your past experiences. It's, so it's extremely important for leaders to understand that. And, and then does it make you more accountable? I think if you can really get your head around the idea that bias is not about this, you know, like, implicitly or objectively evil act that people are doing and it, and it's a natural part of the of human conditioning right um your past experiences and and even the false images that you may have been fed through the media impact who you are if you can realize that and understand that then you have a better shot at making uh holding yourself accountable because it's not about deeming whether you're a good or bad person. Good people don't have biases and bad people, <laughs> you know, do have biases. Everyone has some form of bias. And if you can understand that, then you can be a better leader because you can create a safe environment and, and have those buddy systems. Somebody to say, hey, proofread my speech or, hey, proofread my article. Uh, is there anything in there that I'm not intending to say? And then you can also, as you develop closer and closer relationships with people, because you're going to start to integrate your friend group at home, you're going to start to integrate your personal network at, at the office, you will have um, 
a safer environment to have these discussions. And, and I'm going to share a story. I just want to share a story and how much people can appreciate humility. Humility is a huge aspect. I, I recently went to Seattle and uh, walked into the, um, uh, you know, walked into the um, uh, reception area. And when I got to the reception area, I'm trying to be friendly and there's two reception folks there. And I'm like, hey, who wants it? Who, who, who wants to check it? And the, the person um, kind of, one, one of the people kind of motions me to the other person. And, and the other person was um, a gentleman or, or a person. It was a person, but full beard, goatee, right? But, you know, wearing a dress and, and, with, and with dangly earrings. And she motioned, and, and the, the person who I think identified as female motioned me to the other person and said, oh, you want me to go to him? And immediately I was like, oh. And I said to him, you know, um, that was just like a, a reaction. I didn't mean anything by it. Um, I was just, you know, it was just, I, I didn't even think uh, that was my response. So I really didn't mean to be disrespectful. And the individual was so gracious, um, obviously offering me forgiveness and and just saying, hey, it's fine. And we understand like your, your intent wasn't malicious. And I think catching yourself in those moments and expressing things, and, and that could be anything, right? It could be gender, age, it could have been anything, even educational biases, right? We have educational biases. I've shared this story before. Um, I have 23 peers. I'm probably the only one that doesn't have a PhD or a J JD, yet I'm in the top three performers every year. So um, we have to realize that we have all these biases from the past. And if we realize them, we can that we have them, then we can start modifying ourselves and give ourselves forgiveness. If you catch yourself, in a moment, then just express it. You don't have to act awkward or, you know, look away. You can just say, you know what, that wasn't my intent. And I think you'll find that people are very gracious and that creates an even more belonging environment. And afterwards, uh, on my way out, the reception person and I were able to have some laughs and talk about, you know, all kinds of things that weren't work related, but it, it was a very positive environment. I think that person left um, with a good feeling. And, and I felt like, you know, I, I didn't hurt anybody that day. And I actually connected with someone that day. And so those are kind of realizing that everybody has bias and is so important. And um, leaders need to be able to embrace that as opposed to of characterizing. If I admit that I have bias, then somehow I'm flawed as a human being. And that's just not the case. Senior, I think I'm muted here. Great example there, Cecil, great story. Thank you for sharing. Um, Madhavi, I see you shaking your head. You like this yeah. question. <laughs> I, I think I'm, I'm going to repeat myself by saying like, you know, we all have biases. Like that's how human brain processes information. So period, like that's beyond discussion. Um, but for me, the important piece is, and we will never be like, we as individuals will never be bias-free. What we are aiming for is to reduce our level of biases. But when you're a leader, the more critical thing is, are your biases playing into your decision-making? Because as I said, you have a lot of authority and you have a lot of power and you're making a lot of decisions on a daily basis. Now, I also, like each one, like irrespective of whether you're a VP, a CEO, or an individual contributor, like the, the bias doesn't increase or decrease with your professional like designation. But the point is, as your power and authority increases, the impact and result of those biases and how they show up in decision making impacts many more people and impacts organizations. So though we all have biases, we as leaders need to realize that as leaders, we have an additional responsibility to check those biases. I uh, And two more things I'll say. One is a fun story where I was um, at a couple of jobs before this. I was having a conversation with a leader and he said, I don't have unconscious bias. And I'm like, it's called unconscious for a reason. Like if you knew you had biases, you would not call it as being unconscious. And the one last thing I would, I want to piggyback on what Cecile said, we, because of our biases, we tend to make these mistakes. And you have one or two options when you have the, made this mistake. And Cecile, like that example is amazing because sometimes when you make that mistake, what you do is you feel so bad 
and you try to over apologize to the person and then the person on the other end is like no 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 it's okay now what what basically is happening in this situation you are still trying to center your comfort it's more like now the other person is trying to say like don't feel bad for doing that to me it's okay you but the other piece is being gracious about it apologizing and moving on because then you are still sitting with that discomfort and with that bias and also with a learning that you you know this is what i learned and this is how i need to process so when you come face to face with your biases give yourself a check of like are you trying to react in a way where you're like i still want to like feel comfortable and i didn't have obviously you didn't have the intention but if you're going to over rotate and over index on that it's going to be and like cecil's example is amazing the way he navigated of like not making it overtly and then still connecting with the person after like that's really like oh this was a learning moment i learned and let's move on so i think we all will be better off if we have a little more courage in facing our biases yeah yeah very good very point lovely and also to be a little out there you know we all have our traumas so healing ourselves first and then going out and creating these safe spaces for everybody around us at work um i think is super important because that's what shapes us you know our childhood and um so yeah i just wanted to cite that and also another online implicit association test uh, link here um it gives you a really good understanding of where your hidden biases live Um so yeah I mean if you're interested um it all starts with you you're the inclusive leader you're waiting for um our last question um and this is directed to Denise how do you continue to check on the engagement of your employee Yeah I think that's so critical it's like I think at first we were all focused on let's hire diverse candidates let's hire 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 and then we weren't really focused on retaining them Um so you know I also was looking through the internet and everything I found a statistic about how quickly people make up their minds when they are going to leave a company it said something like um 31% of the employees that left left within 6 months 68% of them left within 3 months so it doesn't just mean okay do your 3 months and 6 ch- months check but it's so critical I'm going to go back to over communicating again uh checking in with the employees you know we have employee surveys um weekly check-ins um at Cisco that i think are are very ben- beneficial um and that as i said it's not just did you complete your assignment did you you know do this did you check your milestone it is is there you know having those transparent discussions on how do you want to be rewarded you know you're doing a great job and i want to make sure that it's meaningful rewards to you which may be different to me or different from your peers how do you want to be rewarded and really going back to treating these people these employees as individual unique individuals and the only way you're going to find out is having those genuine transparent conversations with them on a regular basis it's a great point madavi your perspective how do you check on the engagement of your employees Yeah I I I want to uh, plus one on what Denise said you have to make it and that's the whole point about diversity it's not like you know you have one reward structure and you're offering mm-hmm. everybody the same thing mm-hmm. I would say invest more time in listening and then respond accordingly because it's not going to be like I know what to do this because I as a leader in XYZ company this is how I did that that was a different company that was a different culture but the more you listen to be honest your job as a leader will be easier because your employees are going to be very candid if you have created that culture with you of like how do they want you to support them and i think uh, creating that environment like where, where you feel, where your team members and your employees feel that they can bring those up like at, that should be your prime responsibility and from there you will have enough clues uh, coming in to help you guide that Thank you. I have some love from the audience. Um LinkedIn user says great point Madhavi. Influence can be at every level. Be curious. Thank you Cecil. Um also great topic on biases. Love your thoughts Denise and Cecil. Um yeah, um not deflecting or making excuses when mistakes are made is such a huge step in bridging relations and surrendering connections. Thank you for sharing that Cecil. acknowledging is powerful. 
Um, I have a question here uh, from another user that just got posted. If I am in a company that's struggling to get hiring managers to buy into the value of inclusivity, what can be done? I think you should start with acknowledging that you are in good company. You will not go to <laughs> any other company where you'll not find these groups of managers who have difficulty in buying into the value of inclusivity. I think we have those managers everywhere. I would definitely say a couple of things is it's an uphill battle. You're running against the stream, like just like acknowledging some of those, but also trying to understand not don't make your goal as, you know, I'm trying to change this leader's mindset to be more inclusive. Give yourself milestones because that end goal will take a lot of time. And we don't want you and people like you to be burnt out doing this work. So to me, it's like, what are the milestones? Are you like, now you're showing them the data org of like, how, what's the gender makeup? What's the ethnic makeup? Are you having that conversation? When you bring in next candidate to hire for that leader, is your recruiter having balanced late conversations during intake meetings? So you have to keep chipping at it. I don't want to set the wrong expectation by saying like, you know, go and have a conversation and that will work out. It's a series of continuous conversations, but trust me, that's how we have come this far in making the change. So you'll have to stay at it and try to use different influencing points with your leader. I also want to add, I think goals are important to have, but if you set the wrong goal and you tell your managers, you got to have four women um, in these positions and then they hire women that may not be the best qualified. What does that show all of those people in the group that, oh, you know, they, they don't care about diversity or, or diversity is not a good thing. All these different um, emotions will be seen if you're, you're just hitting a number. Um, and OK, you want a woman in that position? Fine. Let's hire. You know, it's it's got to be qualified. It's got to be a conscious effort to get the best person in for the job and, and seek these diverse candidates as well. So careful about the goals you set. It could drive really bad behavior as well. Cecil, do you want to um, add to that question? Well, it depends on the position you are in the organization in terms of what you can do. But I think the most important thing is to make sure that those conversations are actually happening. And because all of this runs together with these other questions, right? Uh, about even with bias. It's like, we may get, um, you know, uh, depending on the size of the organization, you may hire tons of candidates from a particular um, demographic, either a majority group or, or another group, depending on the, the business. And you may have people who fail out of that group all the time. But then next thing you know, to Denise's point, if you set a goal, you know, but then there's a micro focus on, well, if we if we changed that, that demographic group, like and, and even one of those fails, it's automatically that bias triggers. Oh, well, you know, look, that was a bad idea. So I, the, the main thing is, is to continue to do what you can to reinforce the education of the processes, why these things are good for companies. Um, because they're all people and they're all fallible. Some are going to fit into your organization. Some are not going to fit into your organization. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you need to create an open and inviting environment. And what you can do, again, depends on your role. If you can have these conversations in all hands meetings with hiring managers, great. Um, can you write articles on your intranet? Great. Um, but maybe it's even just in your own employee work um, resource group or in your own department where you can have these conversations. But but that's you have to do what you can do depends on where you are in the company. And then, of course, um, if determining if that's an organization that's right for you at the end of the day, if that or if you feel leadership is not on board, then maybe that's not the place for you. Yeah, that was exactly my thought, Cecil. It may not be the right place for that person. Um, well, thank you all um, for coming on. We're um, up on time. I look up to all of you. Thank you so much for joining the panel. It was a great discussion. Um, thanks for spending the time. It was uh, awesome. And my favorite part was the everyday actions that you know we can do to create a more um, inclusive environment um, and, and just to build a more inclusive 
place at work. It's things me and you can do no matter what our position or role is. So let's make that conscious effort and spring into action and apply a DEI lens to everything that we do, even outside in our communities, um, as it's a journey and it's not a destination. And culture is something that impacts every area of the organization. Um, and change only happens when you make feel, when you make people feel differently. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. And have a great day and happy Halloween. Till next time. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.